Hey, Marge here. Did you know that there's one nerve in your body that when stimulated can actually reduce the activity of the osteoclast, the cells that are breaking down your bone? Well, that nerve is the vagus nerve, and that's what we're going to focus on today. And our special guest is Dr. Nawaz Habib. And Dr. Habib is the best-selling author of Activate Your Vagus Nerve and the newly released Upgrade Your Vagus Nerve. He is also the host of the Health Upgrade podcast. He's a chiropractor who utilized the power of functional medicine to transform his own health. He's the founder of Health Upgraded, an online functional health consulting clinic, supporting optimal health by elevating the awareness and function of the vagus nerve. And in today's talk, we go over the vagus nerve, how it can impact our bonus and overall health. And the best part is what can we do? And he gives us some easy tools that we can all put into our life. So make sure to stay tuned. Welcome, Dr. Habib. It's great to be here. Great to see you. Yes, it was so fun. We just saw each other at the conference, and I didn't know that you had a new book. And I have four years ago, it was four years ago, you were on this podcast, and when you had just, you had just, you hadn't been that long ago that you published this book, Activating the Vegas Nerve, which I have. I have all mine. It's marked up. I've used it for years and recommended it because you gave so many amazing tips and I just thought it was great. But now we have upgraded your vagus nerve. So I'm excited to hear all the details and a fantastic book. And I'm excited to have you back because there's just so many things that are important about the vagus nerve that can not only can really impact our bone health and which is so, so, so important for this community here, but also it will just change your whole life. And what I really love, I like easy tweaks. So I know at the end you're going to share really easy things that people would never have thought of that can really make a big difference. Anyway, so I think we have to bring everybody because not everybody heard your first interview and not everybody knows why you, and maybe even start out your history, why you've gotten so involved for so many years and so focused on this vagus nerve. So why don't you start with, start there? No problem. The vagus nerve has always been of uh, just unique and kind of wonderful importance to me. It stuck out when I was in chiropractic college and was working with some really interesting cases and was going through kind of learning the anatomy. And there was one nerve that just stuck out. It was unique. It was different. And I'm I'm very much the brain guy. I still remember when I was in uh, in high school. Uh, we had a biology project to create a, a mold of whatever organ we decided to, and we had to label it and we had to put it all together and people would do something very simple. And I went for the most complex thing I could possibly do. And that was the brain. So it was a very, I was a very kind of brain neuro kind of geek uh, from a very early age. And there was something that was just unique about this particular nerve. It It didn't fit the mold of simply being part of the nervous system, but rather having connections to almost every other system and somehow having an effect on every system. It was the only cranial nerve, which means it starts within the head cavity, to actually leave the head cavity, the only one to do that. It was the only one, and it's the only nerve within the body that connects to essentially every single organ within the body. So it connects to the heart, to the lungs, to the kidneys, to the spleen indirectly, to the gut, to the stomach, to the intestines, to the liver, to the pancreas. Every single organ actually has a direct vagal nerve connection internally within it. That's unique within the body. That's really what struck a chord in, in my brain and said, what is going on here? Like, why, why are we being told these basic things that it controls what's known as the parasympathetic nervous system? And it's sending these particular autonomic signals, which is important, and we'll get into what that means. But it just felt like it was so unique, and it was really being undersold or underutilized and underappreciated, in my opinion. And so that's where my love and my my passion for understanding what it was really doing came from. And I started going down that path to start to learn what exactly is the mechanism by which this nerve controls and is controlled by and what signals is it sending and receiving in order to get our bodies into a thriving state 
And so that's really where it all kind of started for me was, was there was just something so different about this particular nerve. So then in your clinical practice, what did you start seeing when you focused on, on things to improve the, you know, improve the activity of the, or first of all, why don't you just say what, what might've been problems with this, with this nerve were you seeing? Yeah, it all really came down to this common path between the root causes that a lot of us are aware of as causing the the root of a condition. So the inflammatory triggers, the nutritional imbalances, the exposure to excess toxins, the toxic relationships, the stressful challenges that we all experience being the root causes. And then that common or, or the very well-known kind of Western medicine view of this diagnosis and that diagnosis, there was always this connecting point between these root causes and all of these diagnoses. And that common path between those root causes and those diseases to me was chronic inflammation or the inability to control the inflammatory process. Inflammation is an important process, right? It's it's like pushing the accelerator in a car. And when we push an accelerator on the car, the car is going to go. We're going to be able to utilize the car to get us to a place faster than we can get just by walking simply. But when we put our foot on the accelerator and we don't have a countermeasure, as in we don't have the brakes, that car becomes a danger. It starts to become dangerous to the people around us. It's a danger to us. We could have a car accident. We could get into major troubles simply by not having control over that mechanism. And essentially, that's what's happening within our bodies now, especially in the Western stressed out lives that we live. We're living in a, a situation where our bodies are constantly pushing on the accelerator due to all the different stressors that we are experiencing. And we've forgotten about the brakes and we're not pushing the brakes effectively anymore. And we're not slowing our bodies down to the point where they can recover from those stressors. So the vagus nerve is the brakes to this entire system. It's the me it's meant to be that control mechanism to help lower the inflammatory uh, pursuit or, or how far we're pushing on that inflammatory control. And there's too many stressors and there's too many challenges that's causing our brakes to burn out. And so our vagus nerves are no longer able to control the stress, control the accelerator function quite as much as we would like. And so we're pushing off into the stressed, broken down more, more readily on the accelerator state as, as a society, which is why we're seeing the expansion of so many different diseases. The ICD-10 codes have gotten to 11,000 different codes on these di diagnosis codes. And the vast majority of these conditions are chronic and inflammatory in nature because they simply have not looked at how do we lower the inflammatory burden? How do we control the inflammation that is occurring within the body? So when I started looking into vagus nerve tools, vagus nerve exercises, simple ways to shift the body into that, I started having some pretty phenomenal uh, changes in my patient cases. I started to see that my patients would recover a little bit more quickly, or they would be able to maintain the wonderful changes that we were uh, gaining through their functional medicine support into uh, a long-term healthy state. And that's really what we were trying to create and, and look for as we went through uh, working with all these patients that we've worked with over time. Yeah, I love that. And everybody, we are going to go over. We are not going to leave you without going over tools you can use right after this interview. You can put right into your life. But I want to now go to the bones because this is really interesting in terms of the osteoclast activity and the vagus nerve. Because why don't you explain that? Because this is something we measure. I mean, we know osteoclasts are breaking down our bone. So if we can modulate this at all in any way, shape, or form with you know, by doing things with the vagus nerve, that is just incredible. So why don't you share some share that with us? Absolutely. So like I mentioned, I'm a real science, anatomy, physiology nerd. Like I really love uh, digging into the mechanism by which things are working within the body. And so, uh, and my love for bone comes from obviously being a chiropractor and knowing how movement is meant to occur and having good optimal posture, structure, function, uh, from that. So what I like to do is 
simply put a microscope really deep into what we're looking at that's happening. In a case of bone health, for example, if we're looking at something like osteopenia, osteoporosis, what we're looking at when we look at a slide is simply the breakdown of the matrix of the bone. And the matrix of the bone is made up of calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, all of the, the minerals that are intertwined and interlaid and creating this beautiful matrix system within the bone that creates good, strong, rigid structure that can resist forces. That's really what we're trying to do. And when we look at a healthy bone compared to an osteopenic or an osteoporotic bone, what we're seeing is the matrix pattern is broken down, meaning that those, those minerals that are meant to be there, good and strong and, and thick within the bone, able to resist forces, have been broken down or decreased in terms of how much bone or how much matrix is present. So in osteopenia, it's slightly decreased. In osteoporosis, it's more decreased. And we have to look at the types of cells that are causing this. So within the bone, we've got two major types of cells. There's going to be a whole lot more. We don't even need to get into the bone marrow for that matter. But there's two that we really want to look at. We've got osteoblasts, or three, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. So osteoblasts, are the progenitor cells. They're the cells that help to develop and grow the bone uh, structure and to lay down more of that matrix uh, in the bone to maintain a good, strong, healthy bone. The osteocytes make up the actual bone structure and they have the intertwined matrix within them. The job of the osteoclast is to break down the bone and create remodeling. And this is actually a really good thing to have happen because as we grow, our bone needs to break down the matrix that's there and grow in new forms so that it can handle new forces. So it can handle, uh, as we go from being a baby who is unable to be upright on, on their feet, to sitting, to standing, and our bones then grow into a longer structure. And that requires a balance between some osteoclast activity to break the bone down a little bit and some osteoblast activity to increase the function of laying down the matrix within the bone. So we need this balance to occur. Now, as we get older and we reach the age where our bones no longer are growing, then the balance becomes almost 50-50. There's very little osteoclast activity, ideally, and very little osteoblast activity. So we're not creating new bone and we're not breaking down new bone very excessively. It's still happening, but in very small quantities. Now, what can happen is over time, as the stressors build up, as these the challenges within our body build up, as the minerals in our body start to become depleted over time, we start to pull these minerals from different areas. So for protein, for example, we pull protein from muscle. And so we, over time, tend to lose muscle mass as we age. For calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, for these very important minerals, we pull them from bone. And so we upregulate, we start to increase the activity of these osteoclasts. So the osteoclast activity starts to increase, meaning that we're push, pushing the accelerator on the breakdown of the bone so that we can get more of the mineral into the bloodstream and to help support the function of all of the other cells within our body. But if we don't increase the osteoblast activity at the same level, What's actually happening is we're causing breakdown of the bone. And this over time can lead to osteopenia and osteoporosis. Now, why does the vagus nerve have anything to do with this at all? I realize I'm going real heavy on the science, so we'll, we'll do as simple as we can. In, in all of my research, the thing that I found that is so unique about the vagus nerve is that the target cells of the vagus nerve are immune system cells immune cells that are present in every single organ of the body, every organ that it connects to directly through the vagus nerve and all of the organs that it doesn't connect to directly. The immune system does a lot more than simply protect us from what's coming into our bodies, the challenges, the tech, the, the, the stressors that can add the toxins, the bacteria, parasites, whatever that's coming in. We Not only does it protect us from those things, but the immune system is heavily involved in building bone and building and creating and maintaining the function of every single organ that it's in. And these immune cells are called 
macrophages, these particular ones that I'm talking about, and they're called tissue resident macrophages. And every single organ in the body has these tissue resident macrophages. They are the Kupfer cells in the liver, they're the microglial cells in the brain, they're the macrophages that line along the entirety of the intestinal tract in the gut, and in the bone, they are the osteoclasts. These are tissue resident macrophages in the bone, it means the, the osteoclasts are the immune system cell in the bone, one of them. And the job of the vagus nerve, when it sends out its signal, which is called acetylcholine, is to take these immune cells and put them into a state where the brakes are put on, where we're pushing the brakes and we're not allowing them to do the breakdown and the killing effect that they would do in a defensive mechanism. So the goal of the vagus nerve is to control inflammation, is to control the breakdown processes that these immune system cells have. The osteoclasts, when they become hyperactive, when they get pushed into this breakdown state, trigger osteoporosis or osteopenia by increasing the bone breakdown. But when we don't have the signals of vagus nerve coming in, those signals are increased. But when we have good vagus nerve signals coming in, meaning acetylcholine making its way throughout the entirety of the body because that signal is amplified by other immune cells, those signals of acetylcholine come in, they affect the osteoclast, they say stop breaking down the bone so quickly, slow it down. And what that does is it either will completely stop or really truly slow down the breakdown process that's occurring within the bone. That's true for every single organ. That's true for the liver. That's true for the gut. That's true for the brain. It's true for the lungs, you name it. So every organ in the body requires these vagus nerve signals to lower the immune system activation and put us into a state where we are fixing the issues rather than fighting potential challenges. It's the difference between the fight and flight and the rest and digest system. And so the job of the vagus nerve is to put us into that rest, digest, recover, rebuild type of state. And that's really what we're trying to get to. So there was a really cool study, I think, that we spoke about at IHS and uh, that I'll allude to here. There was a study that was done retrospectively on a significant group of people that had a vagus nerve implant put in. So this is a device, it's an electrical stimulated uh, device that goes right on the neck on the vagus nerve, and it causes the vagus nerve activity to increase. And this was done uh, particularly for um, epilepsy. People that were having seizures, they had epileptic seizures, and this was a great tool because vagus nerve stimulation ended up lowering or stopping epileptic seizures from occurring. Really cool. Now, retrospectively, they went and they looked at the number of people that had these implants put in versus a similar group that had the same condition but didn't have the vagus nerve implant put in to see what were some of the differences that occurred after 10, 15, 20 years of having the implant put in. And one of the big things they found was the group that had the vagus nerve implant had a very, very low incidence of osteopenia and osteoporosis. Wow, that's so fascinating. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, what that means is when the vagus nerve is functioning at a high level, when it's able to function effectively, it's able to send this acetylcholine signal out, not only to the bone, but most importantly in this in this conversation, to the osteoclasts to not go into the breakdown uh, phase quite as heavily. And what that meant was we were able to maintain the function and the strength of bone. I think that's one of the coolest things that that I've ever heard of that came out of this study. So it was really an interesting kind of let's let's pull this all together. And when we chatted, I had to share this with you because I thought it just made so much sense to share with you and with your audience. Well, it's funny when we talked, I was like, you must come on because and we're going to go into what we can do. But this is something that's doable you know, in terms of activating our vagus nerve. And we talk about that in your book. But let's talk, how does a person know? You know, okay, so someone's listening and they're thinking, well, how do I know what the state of my vagus nerve is? So, Yeah, it's a great question. And we finally are living in a situation where we can measure it. And that's really exciting. We can measure it readily. So vagus nerve is part of the autonomic nervous system, meaning that it has direct control over 
um, the heart and the lungs and auto, all of the automatic processes that are occurring within our body that we don't consciously need to think of all the time. Okay. So this includes things like uh, the heart rate, the breath rate, the digestion, the detoxification processes within the liver. They're all con constantly happening. Now, the autonomic nervous system is uh, has two sides to it. And in the exact same way that I'm kind of mentioning, we've got the brakes, which is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the vagus nerve primarily. And then we've got the accelerator, which is called the sympathetic nervous system. And this is the fight or flight system. So when we go to exercise or we have somebody tap us on the shoulder and we're stressed out about something, our heart rate increases, our breath rate changes, we go into a short, shallow breath. That's your sympathetic nerves pushing the accelerator and saying, increase the heart rate. We need to make sure that we are not triggered, that we're not pushed into a state of, of um, kind of threat to our survival. So we're ready to fight or ready to run from something that might be a threat to our survival. And that requires the sympathetic nervous system to turn on. The job of the vagus nerve in this particular situation is to slow the heart rate down. And so what we're looking at is a balance and an ebb and flow of sympathetic and parasympathetic activity. And what we can measure is that ebb and flow of parasympathetic and sympathetic activity in the heart. And that's not measured by heart rate, but it's measured by a different signal called heart rate variability. And we live in this wonderful age where we now have wearable technology, which gives each of us wonderful empowerment to say, I know what I, what's going on within my body. I have these wonderful tools that can help me understand this. So there are amazing wearable technologies out there. I'm wearing my Aura ring right now. Um, there's wonderful kind of arm uh, wrist straps, watches, uh, chest straps, all of these different devices that are out there that are now measuring heart rate variability. What we want to do is we want to see our heart rate variability up. The higher our heart rate variability, the more vagus nerve stimulation, the more vagus nerve function we have that's working really well. So that's what we're really looking for is increased heart rate variability. And that means that we're pushing accelerator and brakes effectively in balance. That's the ideal situation. So all of these wearable tech, if you're looking at them, if you're using them, or if you're thinking about using them, this is one of those tools that I would highly recommend to know where you're at from a heart rate variability, parasympathetic vagus nerve function activity level. Hey, Margie here. If you're looking for a way to stay motivated and get results in your bone building plan, then I have the perfect solution the Happy Bones Club. This is my exclusive members community where you get direct access to me on our live monthly Q&A sessions, along with in-depth classes, guided workouts, and interviews with guest experts. So you can continue to learn about all aspects of your bone health and tailor your journey to strength and vitality with the support of a community working towards the same goals as you are. So just go to tinyurl, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot com slash happy bones club to learn more, or you can click the link in the show notes. I hope you'll join me and be part of this great community. Now back to the show. You know, it's really interesting and I shouldn't admit this, but I will. So four years ago, you were on and right after our interview, I'm like, that's it. Because you, you really raved about the aura ring. And so many of my friends you know, who are practitioners have the aura ring. And I'm like, I'm definitely getting it. Four years ago, I still haven't gotten you. <laughs> after this interview, I am getting it because I definitely want to measure. I do a lot of the practices that we're going to talk about. And I, I guess for everybody, even if you didn't measure, doing these practices are going to be life-changing. But, um, <laughs> but What's funny is I got my aura ring. I've had it for a little over five years now, which means I have all of this data to tell me where I'm at and what I'm looking at. And at this point, I can tell you within a couple of points where my HRV is, I'm pretty close every morning to say, okay, I am I feel like I'm at like a 58 today, uh, not feeling so hot, or I feel like I'm, I've hit my 70s and I'm feeling great today or something like that. And I'm usually pretty close now, which is great to be able to do. So I don't need it quite as much. That said, I love it because what it is, 
I, I'm not worried so much about the number itself, but rather that I'm increasing or finding out the things that are causing that HRV number to go down. It's an empowerment tool. More than anything else, I don't put too much emphasis on the actual number, but rather what that number is telling me about where my body is. Am I recovered? Am I ready to push? And Aura is wonderful. There's a lot of other tools out there as well, but I have five years worth of data on this particular thing. It's a wonderful, wonderful, empowering tool for everyone. I mean, one thing I always liked about it was that, you know, in terms of the EMFs, you don't, you're not, you're not having you know, so many of the, some of the wearables, you're constantly getting yes. signals and this one you aren't. So I, I yeah. So there is a little bit of EMF when you leave it not on airplane mode, but this one has the option of putting it on airplane mode. So you don't have any EMFs coming in. And I do that when I get the opportunity or I remember, make sure to put it on airplane mode, toss it on. And then once you put it on the charger, the airplane mode turns off. So then your phone can communicate with it directly. Yeah, no, that's so great. Okay, so before we get into some things we can do, just explain why did you, you know, this book was amazing. Your first book I thought was so good and so many great things. What, what, why did you decide you needed to write a new one? Like what's happened over this period of time that you decided it was time to educate people on some new new things. That new happened. stuff, yeah. It It really came down to five years of clinical experience, honestly. It was five years of learning and talking to clients and starting to understand what some of the challenges were that caused their vagus nerve to not function very well. What were some of those root causes? What were some of those stressors? And I was able to initially kind of break those stressors down. And so the whole first section of the new book really digs into the different types of stress that we all experience that we may not consider stress or we may not be able to outline. And this is really where I think the the greatest value of the new book is, is getting to understand that we've I, I've come up with or broken it down into four different types of stressors. We've got the emotional stressors, which is kind of the day-to-day -day stress that we call stress on in our lives. And so this is the make sure my bank account's got enough money in it, make sure that I've got the the retirement fund that's that's doing just fine, make sure that the kids are taken care of or the grandkids are taken care of, make sure that the house, like the, the laundry is folded and whatnot, right? These are the emotional stressors of daily life that can be uh, mildly stressful, but can be annoying. And that's usually what we refer to. But there's three other ones that are often overlooked. One is biochemical stress. This is huge because biochemical stress can be uh, the addition of, of excess biochemicals that we should not have, meaning things like pesticides, herbicides, plastics, phthalates, PTFE, PT, or, or the polyester um, clothing and the challenge that comes from some of those things that we might wear that might not be organic or the flame retardants, the things that are in the air around us. There's so many that we're living in. It's almost like we're in a chemical stew at this point. And these are biochemicals that our bodies are being affected by, but we should not be experiencing a ton of um, usually. And then on, in addition to that, it's the lack of nutrients that our body should have. So we're looking at the lack of particular nutrients, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, choline, really, really big one here. We'll talk a little bit about choline, but choline is the, uh, it's an essential Thing that needs to come in from our diet. 90% of people are deficient in choline intake in their body, and it is required to make acetylcholine, which is the signaling molecule of the vagus nerve. So we need to make sure that we have all of these little tools that our body requires, electrolytes, amino acids, all of the things that our body needs to build and maintain good function. And so biochemical stress comes down to either too much of the bad things or too little of the good things. On the physical stress side, this is a third section, is physical stress. And these are often overlooked, but things like car accidents, uh, physical trauma, slip and fall injuries, concussions, things that we've physically experienced a, a breakdown or some sort of um, repetitive strain injury, over-exercising, under-exercising, these are physical stressors. And so they can cause an extra breakdown. And these stressors can lead to breakdown of the vagus nerve in addition to all of the other stressors. And that fourth one is psychological stress. And this is previous history, potentially childhood trauma, 
a victim of a crime, having experienced some significant, like a divorce or uh, loss of a loved one, loss of a family member, something like that. These are major psychological stressors that really scuff the lens through which we see the world. And they are uh, major stressors in the moment, but often are the trigger for the breakdown process to occur, to start occurring. So we need to look into all of those, really understand the timeline by which those things might have happened and what then occurred following in our own health and wellness. Did we start to notice that we had more symptoms six months after the loss of a loved one or after the car accident three months later? I don't know, something just wasn't right and I had all this extra pain and I, I started to notice that my gut function was off or something like that. So we need to look at those and understand the timeline and then we can know where to do the good work of fixing things up, where to address those root causes in a positive way. Are there dietary strategies? Are there going to be lifestyle strategies, psychological strategies, things like that? And I, I got into understanding the polyvagal theory in much greater depth as well. Have you ever heard of the polyvagal theory? No, no. No, I would highly recommend looking into it. It's a theory that was developed by Dr. Stephen Porges. And the whole concept of polyvagal theory is that our vagus nerve can only turn on and keep us in a rest, digest, and recover state when we are in a feeling of safety. When we feel safe, we're able to thrive. And when we don't feel safe, we push over into the stress side, we go into the sympathetic state, and our bodies are constantly pushed into a fight or flight state. And even worse off, it can go into a state of freeze. And that's a whole different level where our body physically will shut down in function. We'll still have vagus nerve function there, but our sympathetics are turned off. And that's a whole different conversation. But this, this whole idea of do I feel safe is the main driver of if our vagus nerve is working or not. It's a really, really interesting concept. Highly recommend digging into that. You know, it's interesting in this community because people are really afraid of a fall and a fracture. It's a huge fear. And, you know, like one of my goals is to try to turn the fear into empowerment and yes. getting strong. You know, as a physical therapist, it's so very important to increase your strength and improve your balance, which which is empowering and which really does reduce the fear. But it is an issue. And now what you're saying, you can take that to the next level. People yeah. don't feel safe. You know, if you're walking, if you're constantly afraid, you're going to fall and have a fracture. I can only imagine how that could affect the vagus nerve. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. I love this book. I thought it was just fantastic, quite honestly. And um, okay. So are we ready now to give people some tips and some of them I hope you say my favorite. Well, can I, I tell you what I started doing the minute we finished our interview four years ago? Let's do it. With the gargling. With the gargling. I love <laughs> How it. How simple. How yes. simple was that one? Why don't you share that one? Because that, that's one that everybody can do so easily with just right after you brush your teeth. <laughs> yeah. I, I love adding simple things in because a lot of the the things that we talk about in functional medicine, the, a lot of the things that we kind of bring up with our patients, with our clients, with our communities tend to revolve around diet and tend to revolve around kind of supplements or you need to buy this in order to get this thing in. And I wanted to add in a lot of the basic things that people were missing from a day-to-day -day basis. And that came down to everything revolving around the breath. The breath for me is the key to creating optimal vagus nerve function and understanding your control of your breath is the determining factor of if your vagus nerve is turned on or off. And alongside, there's a ton of exercises that follow the breath. One of them is gargling. And I love gargling. Gargling, um, in the first book, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, I kind of made a joke about how my dad uh, gargles every single day, morning and evening, without fail. And I used to laugh at him. I used to say, Dad, what are you doing? You're gargling. I don't understand this. You're just so silly. And my dad is uh, 70, oh my God, 76 now. His birthday is coming up in like a week. Um, he's 76 years old, and he is incredibly healthy. He has no health conditions to speak of. He's still physically active. He's still capable of doing a lot of things. Yes, his age is starting to show up a little bit, but he gargled every day, twice a day, morning and evening, 
through my laughter and he was essentially proving me wrong. And, and so I had to shout that out in the first book to say, this is such a simple add on tool. The way it works is we've got vagal extensions to the pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles. These are the muscles that keep the airway open, strong, and patent, and the ones that help to keep our voice pitch uh, working. So vocal cords are um, essentially vibrated and tensioned by vagus nerve signaling to the muscles around it. So the reason I can go really, really low or really, really high with my voice is because I have these vagal projections going to that area to create tension and pull and lengthen and release those vocal cords effectively. So when we gargle, we're taking water in, we're maintaining a good open patent airway, we're creating a vocalization with the vocal cords, and we're making sure not to bring that water into our lungs or aspirate that water. It's one of the most comprehensive kind of wrap around everything will fit within this simple tool. And you can do this for a minute stacked on top of your brushing of your teeth. So literally, if you add one minute in the morning and one minute in the evening on top of your normal routine of brushing and taking care of yourself in the bathroom, you're getting this vagus nerve stimulation occurring. And I'm so, so happy to hear that you've added that into your routine and that you've shared that with everybody because what a simple but effective way to really manage your breath in a really cool way to control the breath. And the important thing here is when we're gargling, we're not inhaling, we're exhaling. And when we exhale, we're actually sending a signal to our body that we're calm. It's the reason why when something goes well, we go, ah, right? That sighing effect and everything kind of, as we sigh, we calm down and our heart rate actually lowers. And as our heart rate lowers, that's the vagus nerve sending a signal to the heart that we're calm. And so these exhales, the longer we can exhale and the shorter we inhale is a direct sign that we don't need to push the accelerator quite as much. We need to push the brakes. Okay, I have two questions. So one, I just want to clarify to people, we're not doing this with mouthwash. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Yes. This we are gargling just... with water, maybe salt water. That's it. Okay. okay. And does it matter what salt we put in the water? I'm less fussed about it, but uh, preferably nothing that's iodized. So I would go with like a sea salt or a Celtic, uh, Celtic salt, something like that would be good. Okay. Second question in terms of the breath, then um, do you have a favorite practice in terms yeah. of the, okay, why don't you share that with us? Yeah. The one that I've found to be really wonderful and really effective is called the four, seven, eight breath. So it's, uh, I like to have people do a couple of things while we are doing that breath. I have them put one hand on the chest, one hand on the belly. You can't see that on the video here, but one hand on the belly. And the goal is that our breath should be diaphragmatic. So we should be taking our breath in, expanding the diaphragm. And that means that our belly should be the one that's expanding with the inhale. And I want our breath to be through the nose. Breathing through the nose is really, really important here. So in through the nose, we're going to hold into the belly and it's going to be a long, uh, slow breath. So four seconds of inhale through the nose. And a seven second hold. And then at the seven second mark, then we start to do an eight second exhale, ideally through the nose as well, but can be through the mouth. And we should feel the hand on our belly moving with those breaths. The four, seven, eight breath I find is really, really effective. It can be a little bit difficult when you're starting out, especially if you're breathing very, very short and shallow and your breaths are, you're at 15 to 18 breaths per minute, which is uh, very, very fast. We want to slow that down. We really want to start to work on extending out the full length of a breath, extending out the exhale in particular, and learning to hold our breath and to breathe calmly, quietly, and, and not noticeably. It's something that I have a, a lot of trouble with. I've not been able to get to the point where my breath is not entirely noticeable to others around me. That's the one that I'm really working on. There's a great book on this that I highly recommend called The Oxygen Advantage by Patrick McKeon. I would highly, highly recommend to anybody who's really interested in digging into the breath and really how to optimize their breath. That book is phenomenal. It's my favorite for sure. So four seconds of inhale to the belly, hold for seven seconds, eight second exhale. 
The reason we're doing the exhale longer again is as we exhale, vagus nerve turns on. As we inhale, sympathetics turn on. So we want to do short inhale, hold, long exhale. That's a wonderful way to go to that direction. Yeah, okay. I love that. Okay, any other ones you want to share with everybody? Um, for breathing pattern, you can also do like a box breath of four second in, four second hold, four second out, four second hold could work as well. Not going to be quite as effective on addressing the respiratory sinus arrhythmia and your HIV, but it's a great place to start when people are stressed. Okay. Any other techniques you want to share, any of your favorite or that you found most effective with the people you work with that are easy to implement? Yeah. Um, easy in terms of practice, but not easy in terms of uh, wrapping your head around it is uh, cold showers. <laughs> That's always a tough one when people are like, excuse me, what? You want me to get into cold water in the shower? Yes, absolutely. There are tons and tons of new research articles coming out and lots of great articles showing that there is a very strong benefit to cold therapy or temperature therapy overall. And so I dig into temperature therapy in the book as well. Uh, some of the new research that's come out in the last few years and this temperature therapy concept really comes down to creating these heat shot proteins within the body, but also controlling your breath while you're in these situations. So you can imagine if you were to jump into a cold pool or a cold lake or a cold plunge, which is now, you know, the cool Instagram thing to do is to get into a cold plunge. The, the thing that happens is your body immediately tenses up and says, what the heck is happening here? I'm under stress. My body is going into this state of shock and I go into fight or flight. And so automatically the most common reaction is we go into a very short, very shallow breath and we go into a full sympathetic state. Our eyes go wide. We go, oh my God, what is happening? And the goal is to learn to control your breath, control your heart rate and slow everything down and get into that parasympathetic state while under the stress of being in the cold plunge or the cold water. So a simple one that we can do is at the end of your shower, turn the water as cold as possible. Let it hit you in a sensitive area. For me, back of the neck will always do that. I'll get into the situation where I tighten up and then I slowly release my fists, slowly release, and I do my breathing and I do my best to bring the, the memory and my attention to my uh, solar plexus into my belly to go back to that belly breath. And that's a great way to learn how to do the effective parasympathetic breathing, even when you're under a situation of stress. And the practices are really do you ever cool. go? Do you ever then turn it back to hot and then back to cold? Do you ever go back? People to can. I don't like it. I need to finish up on cold and that tends to be the way that I get out and I just feel <laughs> ready to go for the rest of the day because I've really woken myself up with a cold shower. <laughs> Yeah, no, I do. I turn it actually back and forth a little bit. Always, awesome. end, always end on cold, but it really, it, it's just a great technique. And it and really is. Everybody thinks that's what I like, you know, it doesn't cost anything. You have the shower. So absolutely. That, that's really, I wanted to just ask you, is or I'm not, in the end of your book, I really like the last chapter you talk about creative pursuits. Do you want yes. to share something? Because that was really, yeah, a really cool thing yeah. that um, I, I share this story in the book, but I remember I was in the Lego store with my daughter and with her best friend and they were sitting there playing, building things. And then we were about to leave and a gentleman walked by, he was probably my age. He was holding like three big boxes of Lego things that he was about to build. And he walked by and I looked at him and I was like, oh, those look really cool. One of them was a Batmobile. I'm a Batman fan. And he walked by and he looked at me and he goes, Lego really calms the mind. And I, I, thought about it. I said, that's a really interesting statement. I wonder why he would say that. And they started doing some research and it wasn't necessarily Lego itself, but for some people that, that function, that, that thought process of creating something from uh, blocks or building, that's their creative pursuit. For other people, it's music. For other people, it's, it's art of some other form. For some people, it's sport, right? Some sort of creative pursuit when we feel absolutely safe when we feel absolutely capable that's when our bodies thrive that's when our bodies go into a situation where we are creatively at our best and when we're doing that we tend to unconsciously or subconsciously 
breathe slowly go into a calm comfortable building state we're not sitting in stress and that concept of calming your mind is going to then have a full effect on calming your body it's simply pushing the brakes to put you into that really cool state so finding a creative pursuit for my daughter is it's painting as you can see behind me here um <laughs> it's their favorite thing to do they will paint everything i have two two daughters they're almost seven and three and every weekend every weekend morning there's there's paint all over our kitchen table and the, the world goes crazy but they get to do something that they love to do and they go through this creative pursuit and um, it's just one of those really unique tools that anybody can start to utilize that can help them shift into that state. It's one of those reasons those adult coloring books became as cool as they were because they're meant to calm our minds and to go into a state where we're feeling safe and able to build or create something. So funny you just said that. I was just thinking that in my mind, the adult coloring books. But I teach happiness and I just believe that we should bring more joy. So I, when I read that chapter, I was like, <laughs> How nice is that? You know, you're helping your vagus nerve, you're helping your overall health, and you're doing something that that is going to bring more happiness and joy Absolutely. into your life, which we all want. Well, any other things you want to share? Oh, you have a couple tools that you've been using. You want to share those? Because yeah. that's fascinating that there's so, tools too. When I wrote the first book, it wasn't in my purview, and it wasn't really something that was in my uh, my surroundings. But I mentioned it earlier slightly when we talked about the osteoporosis and the effect that vagus nerve implants had on uh, not allowing the bone to break down. Well, a few years ago, I started to really try to figure out when I had people that had significant inflammatory conditions, I needed something to get them out of that state, something more than just breathing, humming, chanting, gargling, singing, creative pursuits. I needed something a little bit stronger as a therapeutic device. And uh, electric vagus nerve stimulation came, came across my, my desk and I was in contact with a company that I'd been trying to connect with. And this company held all these patents for non-invasive electrical vagus nerve stimulation, literally on the vagus nerve, which is located in the neck at the carotid artery. So if you find your pulse, you're literally within a couple of millimeters of finding your vagus nerve. And what this device does well, I've got it right here, actually. <laughs> so this is uh, one of the versions of the device called a Gamma Core Sapphire. And what it does is it goes directly on the neck right where your pulse is. And you turn the device on and it electrically stimulates using a very particular frequency that's um, through their whole patented process they've found through fMRI studies that it signals directly to the brainstem in the areas where the vagus nerve comes in. And... They have FDA clearances for migraine, cluster headache, hemicrania, continuum, PTSD. Really, really cool stuff. That said, they have phenomenal research in all of these other conditions, gastroparesis, inflammatory bowel disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all of these major conditions that had an inflammatory component, something like this could be really useful in. So I started to utilize it with my patients and the results were astounding. The thing that I essentially came to this realization is our bodies cannot heal when we're in a sympathetic state. Our bodies can truly only heal when we're in rest, digest, recover state. That requires the vagus nerve to be turned on. And in some people's cases, their vagus nerves are not functioning at the level that they need to. And so electrical stimulation is a great way to do it. And these non-invasive devices are simple, easy to use, quick and have such phenomenal uh, kind of results that, that we've had going on with a ton of patients. So I've worked with people that had blood sugar challenges, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and I've helped to bring some of those challenges much, much better in addition to some of the other work that we did. So in combination with dietary support, uh, with certain probiotics, and vagus nerve stimulation, bringing hemoglobin A1C from 9.2, three to 7.2 within four months. Pretty phenomenal, right? And without any medication, which was really cool. Um, I had a, a patient who had Parkinson's disease and one of his first symptoms uh, when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's was uh, a significant loss of smell, anosmia. He essentially hadn't smelled anything in about 13 years. 
And 10 days into using his device, he messages me on, on my messaging system. He says, I need to talk to you today. So I gave him a call. And he goes, I just woke up and I could smell my wife cooking bacon downstairs. <laughs> my brain exploded a little bit that day. It was really cool to hear. But I've, I've heard so many cases where people are sleeping better. They're recovering better. They're getting into the state more readily, more easily off of a two-minute stimulation on their neck that's primed to help shift them into that state readily. And then I pair that with the, the exercise and the breathing exercises, the gargling, the humming, chanting, cold showers. We add one or two other exercises in addition to the vagus nerve stuff, because if they're out, they're doing something with family, they don't have their device with them. What else can they do if they feel stressed? The add-on is start doing the breathing exercises and stuff like that. And what we're doing is we're creating through neuroplasticity, we're building a good, strong vagus nerve. And that tool has been really effective for numerous people that had significant challenges, really helping to shift into a healing state. So uh, electrical vagus nerve stimulation is great. For anybody who's interested, the device that I'm the big fan of, it's the same company. It's called True Vega, T-R-U, V-A-G-A, True Vega. And if you put in my code health upgraded, uh, you'll get, I think it's $10 off or something off the device, but it's a great, great device, great therapeutic tool to help to shift. And it's literally a two minute stimulation to help create this wonderful um, push to healing and, and getting your body into that healing state. Is there any, so a couple of things, so it's two minutes. How many times a day do you recommend? You can do it once or twice a day. I feel like once a day uh, for for people that are at the beginning stages or working on maintenance, twice a day if you're in a therapeutic uh, state, you need some more help. And you can do, like the FDA's cleared up to 30 stimulations a day for two minutes. So you're you're free and clear, basically. There's so not people, a lot of negatives. People don't need to work with a practitioner on this. There's nothing dangerous about Unless it. Unless there's other root cause issues, you don't necessarily need to work with a practitioner. That said, um, there are no real contraindications other than any metal in the neck. Obviously, if you have an electrical device, you can't have metal in your neck. So um, cervical spine fusion with metal. Um, if you have a pacemaker, as long as a pacemaker is inserted a little bit lower than your neck, you should be just fine. And there haven't been any studies in pregnancy. Um, not a huge issue with your audience, but um, probably uh, for those they might be talking to, hasn't been tested. But I'm, I'm, I haven't seen any issues pop up. Basically, is the best way to say it. Wow. So as you were saying, you would do that and then follow it with one of your other techniques. Like yes, that. exactly. So while you're doing the two minute stimulation doing a four, seven, eight breath at the same time, or uh, focusing on your breathing, focusing on the exhale, nasal breathing, humming is a great way to, to pair it as well. And what we're looking at is creating these stronger neuronal connections, vagus nerve connections to the muscles and to the organs below. Wow. Isn't that, isn't that nice? How much does something like this cost? What are we, what are we talking about? Depending on which version you're getting, it's anywhere between three and $500. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. Think any other things you wanted to share before we end? Um, no, I think I think really, honestly, the thing that a lot of people are missing when they're looking at their health journeys and they're trying to create all the dietary and lifestyle changes that are required, they tend to stress about it a lot. And we're we're almost going into a state of something called health anxiety, where we're becoming more anxious about not feeling healthy or wanting to feel healthy. And that is actually doing a real disservice to us. It's actually putting our bodies into a sympathetic state further while dealing with health challenges. And something I would highly recommend for anybody who's experienced this particular challenge is do your best to calm your mind about these things. Do your best to try to create this situation where your body is in a safe healing state and then all of the other things that you're doing will actually start to work significantly better. Our, our, your gut will be able to absorb the supplements more effectively. Your intestinal tract will be able to move food along more effectively. And you won't have as many challenges with uh, like gastroparesis or slow motility or anything like that because your body's in that, that parasympathetic state. We, we need to get these signals out there and that requires a feeling of safety. And if we become anxious about the health challenges that we're at, 
we no longer feel safe within our body. It's necessary to help to shift to uh, a, a non-anxious state when we're starting to talk about getting into a healing state. Wow. It's so funny because you know I've been a physical therapist for 40 years now, and I noticed that very early on that if people, people did not heal when they were stressed and in that sympathetic state, we had to get them in the parasympathetic state to heal. It made such a difference. And so for, I've been teaching happiness and stress reduction really for 40 years, but people don't value it. I have to be honest with you, especially, I, I, this is what I found that people in my community are so worried, just like you said, about the food they're eating and the exercises, and they're just panicked about this, breaking a boat, not realizing that the stress piece is so detrimental to your health and equally is important to address. So you know what I do? It's actually, I've, I've just included in my program, it's non-negotiable. So my happiness course is part of my membership, like doesn't even, because I just feel it's so, you know, these these practices and the stress reduction is just so important. So I am just totally right with you. And I'm so grateful. I love the book. I loved it the first book, but this is amazing. And, you know, it's not something your doctor is going to say to you, oh my gosh, you're being a sniffer. <laughs> you know, so I think it's so great that you bring this out and you're sharing it with the world. And it's not easy to write a book. And so that you took that extra step to get the new information in. And I'll have all the information in the show notes because this just came out. I'm just so yeah. glad we bumped into each other at the meeting. And my book is actually signed with who? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being here. And is there how can what's the best way for people to follow you and what what's what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? On social media, just look up Dr. Navaz Habib. Um, or you can go to drnavazhabib.com uh, and you can learn more about uh, what I do and how I work with people. And if you're really interested in the book, I've got a workbook that goes along with it. Great. That is awesome. And you can find it at vagusnervebook.com. V-A-G-U-S nervebook.com. Vagusnervebook.com. Oh, I'll put that in the show notes. Oh, that's wonderful. So while they're going through this, they can actually write about it. And do you still see patients? Still yeah, absolutely. Oh, so I'm my online well. clinic is, uh, is called Health Upgraded. And I'm still seeing people and still working with people, uh, both in a one-on-one -on -one and group setting. So depending on kind of the need of the client, we'll fit them to where we need, you know, where they need the support and uh, try to get them functioning at a much higher level. And is this in person or is this virtually? Everything is online. Oh, great. Okay. Well, this is wonderful. All right. So we'll have all the links. And again, it was great seeing you, but thank you for sharing all this with everybody today. It's always a pleasure. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Habib as much as I did. And now I have some great easy tools you can put into your life that will improve and activate your vagus nerve, which can help both your bones, your overall health, reduce your stress and increase your happiness. Make sure to check out the book. I think it's really wonderful. And it also comes with that workbook. I'll have that link in the show notes. And my membership every month, we have a happiness program that really helps increase your happiness and reduce your stress, which as Dr. Habib said, also improves the activity of your vagus nerve. So thank you so much for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.